Well, hello, I'm Dr. Shante Haynes with Heart to Heart Truth Ministries, and it truly is my pleasure to bring you this encouraging message. Uh, we're in this I'm Building Something series, and it has truly been going through Nehemiah a blessing. So let's go ahead and bow. Most gracious and heavenly Father, we do thank you for the word. We thank you for your word that encourages our hearts and our minds that really just, Lord, thank you so much for a word in due season. So we're asking for that word again today to encourage us as we continue to build, as we're on a mission. Lord, we thank you for strengthening us to complete it. It's in Jesus' name that we do pray and give you thanks. Amen. Well, again, we are in the I'm Building Something series, and this is part seven. And today we're going to be in Nehemiah, the sixth chapter. And let's just go ahead and jump right into the word. The Bible records for us. When Sanballat, Tobiah, Geshem, the Arab, and the rest of the enemies heard that I had built the wall or rebuilt the wall and that no gap was left in it, though at that time I had not installed the doors in the gates, Sanballat and Geshem sent me a message. Come. Let's meet together in the villages of the Ono Valley. But they were planning to harm me. So I sent messengers to them saying, I am doing a great work and cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I leave it and go down to you? Four times they sent me the same proposal and I gave them the same reply. Sam Ballot sent me the same message a fifth time by his aide who had an open letter in his hand. In it was written, it is reported among the nations and Geshem agrees that you and the Jews plan to rebel. This is the reason you are building the wall. According to those reports, you are to become their king and have even set up the prophets in Jerusalem to proclaim on your behalf, there is a king in Judah. Hmm. These rumors will be heard by the king. So come. Let's confer together. Then I replied to him, there is nothing to these rumors you are spreading. You are inventing them in your own mind. For they were all trying to intimidate us, saying they will become discouraged in the work and it will never be finished. But now, my God, strengthen me. Verse 10, I went into the house of Shemaiah, son of Delaiah, son of Methabal, who was restricted to his house. He said, let us meet at the house of God inside the temple. Let us shut the temple doors because they are coming to kill you. They are coming to kill you tonight. But I said, should a man like me run away? How can I enter the temple and live? I will not go. I realized that God had not sent him because of the prophecy he spoke against me. Tobiah and Samballad had hired him. He was hired so that I would be intimidated, do as he suggested, sin, and get a bad reputation in order that they could discredit me. My God, remember Tobiah and Samballad for what they have done. And also Noadiah, the prophetess, and the other prophets who wanted to intimidate me. Verse 15, the wall was completed in 52 days on the 25th day of the month Elul. When all our enemies heard this, all the surrounding nations were intimidated and lost their confidence, for they realized that this task had been accomplished by our God. During those days, the nobles of Judah sent many letters to Tobiah and Tobiah's letters came to them for many in Judah were bound by oath to him since he was a son-in-law Shechaniah son of Era and his son Jehonian had married the daughter of Meshulam son of Barakia these nobles kept mentioning Tobiah's good deeds to me and they reported my words to him and Tobiah sent letters to intimidate me. Wow, there is something going on. 
There is absolutely so much going on when you're on a mission. When we're on a mission from God, God sends us an assignment. There's always an enemy that is there to attack. So today, part seven, and you're still building something here. In this series, my mission matters. My mission matters. When God has you on assignment, don't let the little things spoil the mission. When God has you on assignment, hear me good. Every pastor, every leader, every teacher, every business owner, when God has you on a mission, don't let the little foxes spoil the vine. You know, sometimes you can go on a trip and I've heard it told of many preachers who were doing conferences that all of a sudden their door keys to the hotel wouldn't work and they would be sitting in the lobby or they'd have to go down three or four times for the keys to work. Could be a little bit of frustration, but the whole idea is to get you off your game so that you won't be in the spirit. You'll start getting in the flesh. What about a car breaking down on your way or a flight being delayed or accommodations being substandard and you're like, hey, I could just go down the street to another hotel. They don't even have to know. I'll come back here late or a late pickup, anything to get you distracted so that you're not paying attention to the mission. You're focused should be on those that you're going to serve. Your focus should be on meeting their needs. That's what our focus should be on all the time. But sometimes we get caught up in what is the profit going to be here? What do I need to do there? Who is going to be coming? How can I serve them that are in the area and not the people who came to receive? We don't necessarily want to look for a title. We don't want to necessarily only be paying attention to those who have some prestige. We want to pay attention to everyone who is in the house. Well, there are some tricks, some tricks of the trade, if you would, that came up. The book written by Nehemiah identifies some of these tricks that are coming up. But hey, tricks are for kids once we grow up. Once we know and we see what Satan's plans are and what his little J-O-B is, you know, he only has so many tools in his bag of tricks. But guess what? We're going to deal with those tricks today because I want you to be encouraged. The first one was distraction. Sitting back letting to my, hey, come, let's talk. We need to have a conference. Meetings, if they're not productive, they're ineffective. They're just a distraction to keep you from getting the work done. We need to get the work done. These fake meetings, this hidden agenda, these ulterior motives that they had, or to get him off of his game. Anytime there's small talk, anytime someone calls you on the phone and say, hey, let's go take a break. Let's go do some fun. Let's go shopping. Let's go up, do this break from work. You're not getting the work done and the work is still waiting for you when you come back. Yes, breaks are good if it is appropriate. But when a person out of the blue calls you and you know they're a distraction, don't look at that text. Don't pick up that phone you know better. So Nehemiah said he would not be deterred. In other words, we need to be as 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter in the 58th verse says, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing for as much as you know that the labor that you have in the Lord is not in vain. The second thing that comes up is disguise. That's right. They try to disguise themselves. They send a letter. The letter is sent with a lot of invented false statements, lies, rumors, always talking about the rumors they're going around telling you. Have you ever had anybody try to tell you what you're thinking? And you're sitting there going, I wasn't thinking that. Or what your motive was. I wasn't thinking that. I wasn't trying to do that. They're getting you to try to doubt yourself so that you're. it's a disguise to get you frustrated, to get you off your game, to get you messed up. That's not going to get you because tricks are for kids. Your message matters. Your mission matters and you're on your way. They're trying to intimidate you because they wanted, or in this case, they were trying to intimidate Nehemiah because they wanted to discourage the people from continuing to get the work done. They were doing the work. Remember, they were fighting with one hand. They were had swords in the uh, or sorry, they had swords in one hand, but they were hammering with the other. They were working. So in all of that, we have to recognize what Nehemiah said. He goes, "But my God, strengthen me, 
he wanted to be strengthened. It reminds me of Hebrews chapter number 12, verse 12. It says, strengthen my feeble hands and my weakened knees, Lord, my tired hands and my weakened knees, Lord, prayer is your weapon. Yes, opposition is going to come. They're opposing the mission. The point is for them to get you to stop, to not get you, to get you to back up, to get you to shut up, to get you to shut down, to get you to cease and desist, to get you to not carry out the plan that God has for you. But you're not going to fall to either one of these tricks so far, distraction or the disguise that they have. The third one is deception. False prophets. He says, the false prophet, he says, hey, come on to the temple with me. We're going to go get locked up in here because they're getting ready to kill you. He said, I'm not going to believe you because, see, I tried it. The Lord revealed to me that you were not. False prophets trying to tell him to sin. He Only the priests were supposed to go into the temple. So he was trying to get him to sin so he would discredit himself. And so his integrity would be also in question. That's not going to happen. Don't fall for the temptation. If there's a temptation for finances, oh, cook the books, nobody will know, don't do it. A, a, a temptation for sexual sins, don't go with that hardly. You should not do that. A premature promotion, hey, if you do this for me, then I'll make sure you get this on the other hand. You know, those smooth talking, slick talking people, you see them all the time on TV, but do you recognize them in real life? You have to be on guard. The Bible tells us in 1 John 4 and 1, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirit to see whether or not it is of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. You don't want to fall prey to those. The fourth trick that is identified in Nehemiah chapter number six is to discredit. That's right. They give a false report. And in that report, I notice he says, this is what has been coming up. And Geshem agreed. Really? Your name dropping? Name dropping? I don't know about you, but it's one of my pet peeves. When people start dropping names, I'm wondering, why are you hiding behind them? Sometimes they just say, well, and other people said they don't even drop a full name. That's because they don't have anybody coming with them, but they think that because they got a crowd, you're going to bow down. Oh, don't do it. Don't fall prey to that. That's to discredit you. Don't tarnish your own reputation or your integrity because of what somebody else is saying or somebody else is doing. That's not the case. So I remind you of Isaiah, the 54th chapter in the 17th verse. It says, no weapon formed against you is going to prosper. And every tongue that rises up against you in judgment, you shall show to be in the wrong. You shall condemn. That's right. And then in addition to that, Romans, the 12th chapter in the 19th verse, vengeance is mine saith the Lord. So yes, the enemy is going to come just like he came for Jesus. Jesus is our best example. What did he try to do? Satan, even in the wilderness, from the very beginning, tried to get three things at him, right? The tools that Satan has in his bag of tricks, they are never changing. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. He tried stones, turn it into bread, forget your complete mission, Oh, bow down to me and I'll give you a premature promotion. Remember all of those things. Jesus didn't fall for it. Then you got the Sadducees and the Pharisees that come and they try to test him and everything that he was doing. They tested his authority. They tested what he said. If he knew the word, if he was following Moses' law, if he was following anything that was of God because they didn't believe that he was coming over to take over their power. They even tried to trick him with what we call a two-horned dilemma. Remember the woman caught in adultery? What are you going to do? Are you going to stone her? Jesus was very smart about how he handled it. They even tried to denounce the miracles that he worked. And even going to the people who received the miracles to say, he really didn't do that. Oh, curse him. And, you know, believe, you know, worship God. Identify that God did it, not him. And you know, beyond a shadow of a doubt, who did. They set him up even for crucifixion for just a few coins. So what did Jesus do? He stayed focused on the mission. The mission was for our salvation. The mission was to go to the cross, teach the word, be the, the expressed image of God in the flesh so that we would know what God's character was like, that he would bring him close to us, but he ultimately needed us to be reconciled to him. So 
your mission does matter. And I'm here to encourage you, if you are a pastor, if you are a teacher, if you are a business owner, I'm here to encourage you today. Why? Because opposition is going to come when you have an assignment from God. Keep going. That's what I want you to take away from you today. You have to keep going. Um, you are about to do a great work. You're in the process of doing a great work. So don't let and don't sweat the small stuff. Sometimes your mission might seem small, might seem small to others. But think about this fact. There were babysitters for Billy Graham, for Miles Monroe, for Martin Luther King Jr., even from your favorite pastor or teacher. What if they thought that their mission was small? They played a big part in their lives and their lives have impacted many. Same thing's gonna happen for you. You're on a mission. You've got work to do. Go do that great work and be encouraged to keep going. Don't let someone stop you. Don't let someone kick you back and, and shut you down or shut you up. No, do it. If God has called you to it, you can do it. And there's so many of us waiting to hear what you have to say because God has placed a word on the inside of you. Stay focused on the mission and swat the mosquitoes. That's right. Don't want to talk to you. Don't need to talk to you. Nope, don't need a, no meetings today. Nope, not doing it. Going to keep doing the work. Sword in one hand, hammer in the other. And lastly, I want to leave with you. A simple response can communicate effectively. No is the complete sentence. Are you coming? No. Are you going to meet with us? No. Are you going to come down from the wall? No. Are you going to go into the temple? No. No, I'm not going to do that. Don't have time for this long, drawn out conversation to tell you that you are trying to discredit me. You're trying to disguise yourself as something that you're not. You're trying to be deceitful or deceptive and you are just trying to discredit me. I don't even have to tell you all of that. All I simply have to say is no. Your work matters. Your message matters. Your mission matters. You are here to solve a solution or to bring a solution to a problem that is here on this earth. And until you solve it, it'll kick, kick down the can or down the road to the next generation if you don't solve it. I beg you, do what God has called you to do. You know it follows his character. You know it's in his heart. And there's so many of us that are waiting for you. Let's bow. Most gracious and heavenly Father, God, we do thank you. We thank you for the assignments that you have given us. Lord, some might seem bigger than others, but all of them are important. Can you imagine, or we imagine, the fact that you picked Mary, you handpicked her. Lord, many might think that it was, it was, hey, it could have been me, but we all could not have gone through what you allowed her to go through. You knew what was in her. You knew her heart. We couldn't have been a David. You knew what was in his heart. Father, Thank you for the assignments that you have given each and every one of us. Let us work the work that you have called us to. Let us put our hand to the plow and never turn back. Father, we want to be strengthened when our hands seem tired. We need an Aaron and a her on either side to continue to hold us up. Encourage our hearts today. Encourage us and let us know, Lord, that you have not only used our words, but you've used our lives to be a message and a mission, a testimony for others to see and hear so that we, Lord, would be able to do what you call. We want our to be the best option on this planet. Our brand, our business, our ministries, we want them to reach the people you called us to, to be impactful, to influence, to do what you have called us to do. And yes, Lord, there's sometimes discouragement. Yes, Lord, we see the deception. Yes, Lord, we see all of the tricks of the enemy. But Father, keep us focused. Strengthen us where we are. Encourage our hearts. Remind us. Anoint us afresh. Speak to us, Lord, and let us be reminded when it doesn't sound like you or your character, when it's not in your word, then it's not something that we're going to go against, and we're going to be obedient to you. Thank you for calling us. Thank you for commissioning us. Thank you for the assignment. And thank you for strengthening us so that we would then be able to continue. It truly is in Jesus' name that we do pray and give you thanks. Amen. 
Well, God bless you today. God has got some great things for you. And I'm excited about what you're building and why you're building it, because it's a plan to help others. I'm Dr. Shante Haynes with Heart to Heart Truth Ministries, helping you put feet to your faith so that you can walk victoriously. Have an absolutely fantastic rest of your week. You can find us online at h the number two h truth.org. At Heart to Heart Truth Ministries, we're helping believers live an abundant life based on God's word, standing on his promises, walking out his principles, sharing with God's people, serving as unto the Lord.